Good evening, friends. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this Wednesday night time in the Word of God together. I want to encourage you to grab your Bible and have it handy and maybe a notepad and a pen where you can jot down some references and then you'll be able to look back over these, <clears throat> these biblical references later and meditate and think about them. I want to talk to you tonight about how to live as a steward in this pandemic. How to have God's best, how to have God's blessing and his favor even in a pandemic. And I believe you're going to find this to be right out of God's word and some principles and laws about God that can be life transforming and life changing. So let's open in a word of prayer and then we're going to look to God's word together. Father, thank you for your word. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. And so today as we look to your word, I pray that you will give us revelation. I pray that you'll give us insight. Let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened so we can know the good things you have for us. I thank you for that in advance. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Now let me just start by sharing with you a principle or a precept about God that you find revealed in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22. Now this principle or precept is the fact that God has laws that he puts in place. When I call it, call it a law, I'm talking about a, a principle. I'm talking about an operational principle precept or principle by which God functions and operates and he lines out these parameters himself in his word. So you want to know how God operates, what God's responsiveness is to us, how God functions, what God does and what God does not do, you can find it in the word of God. And he gave, he gave Noah right up front after the flood, after he had rescued Noah and his family in the ark, and Noah comes out, God puts a rainbow in the sky, and by that rainbow, God was saying that I promise to never destroy the earth with a flood like this again. That, that rainbow was a sign of the covenant that God had with his people. <clears throat> that covenant still pertains to us. I know the rainbow has been used to speak to other issues in the 21st century, but be reminded that the rainbow was really put in the sky by God to say, I'm a God of my word, and I, I give you my word. Every time you look on the rainbow, you can be reminded that I will never destroy the earth with a flood again. And God said something after that. He made a statement about a perpetual law that, ha that is in place, remains in place, and it's a principle that God chooses to operate by and parameters that he functions within. Listen to this. In, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, God said, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. Or in other words, there will be planting and and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Now those are perpetual laws that God's speaking of that have to do with the operation of this planet that we live on. But the words that he used, seed time and harvest, have multiple applications. Now, now I want to show you something about this law of seed time and harvest. Because just a few chapters later, there you find the birth of a man named Isaac. He is a promised child given by God to Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham dies. Isaac grows up, chooses Rebekah as his wife. And uh, there's a, a massive, severe famine that strikes the land in Genesis 26. And it says that that the same kind that had happened before in Abraham's time. And so Isaac moved down to Gerar, 
where Abimelech, king of the Philistines, lived. And God appears to him in verse 2 and said, Don't go to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I'll be with you and bless you, and I will confirm that I'll give all of these lands to you and your descendants, just as I solemnly promised Abraham, your father. I'll cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I'll give them all these lands, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I'll do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions, so Isaac stayed in Gerar. Now, now bear in mind, that there is a horrific famine that has struck the land, including the land of Gerar. But listen to what verse 12 says about Isaac. It says, When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted for the Lord blessed him. So he planted seed, but God gave him a harvest in a time of famine that was 100 times more than the seed that he had planted because God blessed him. He became a very rich man and his wealth continued to grow. He acquired so many flocks of sheep and goats, herds of cattle and servants that the Philistines became jealous of him. So they went out and filled up all of Isaac's wells with dirt. These were the wells that had been dug by the servants of his father Abraham. Now here's what I want you to get from that this particular portion of Old Testament. Now first of all, be reminded that God had already said as long as the earth remains, there's going to be a perpetual law of the harvest that will always be in place. There will always be seed time and harvest. In other words, there will always be the planting of seed and the harvesting of a crop as a result of the seed that you sown. Now it's interesting that in a time of famine or in a time of of pandemic, such as they were experiencing there in Gerar, pandemic referring to this widespread famine that was impacting every single person, both Isaac and his family as well as all of the Philistines, Isaac chose to do something in a time of famine. He took his seed. He didn't hide it. He didn't use it to make bread. He didn't use it for his own consumption. But he rather took that seed and he planted that seed And God blessed the seed that he sowed and gave him a harvest 100 times the amount of the seed that he planted. It was such a great harvest that it made the enemy jealous. They saw the hand of God upon the life of Isaac. And it was seen as blessing through a hundredfold harvest in a time of famine. Now, let me just tell you, uh, it's real easy to get an idea or a mindset or a perspective in a time of difficulty like we're in right now. Let's just compare the two. Let's just say in the same way that Isaac was living in a time of widespread famine, you and I are living in a time of widespread pandemic. And it's impacting the society you live in. The, econ- the economy of the society that you live in, and, and maybe even people that you know personally as well as yourself. And it is a natural tendency in your flesh during this time to take the seed that you should use for sowing and to somehow consume it all, hold on to it, hide it, hang on to it with all that's within you, even to the neglect of sowing seeds that don't belong to you. And I'm referring to the tithe. In there, there, it's, it's very natural in the flesh during a time like we're living right now 
for you to come to the conclusion that circumstances are so difficult around me that I'm not going to give to the church. I'm not going to return my tithe to the Lord in my local church, but I'm just going to hold on to it until I see how the outcome of this thing happens. Did you know Isaac could have held on to his seed? He could have used the seed that he sowed and he could have made food from it. He could have consumed the seed that when he had sown it produced a hundredfold harvest because God blessed him. He sowed in famine and God blessed him with this incredible harvest. It's, it, it's, it's an instructional lesson for you and me to remember that as long as this world remains, not only in agriculture, but also spiritually and economically, as long as this world remains, there will always be seed time and harvest, which means that regardless of what things are like around us today, out in this, uh, this pandemic, that God is still honoring the laws that he has placed himself within to operate. And that's seed time and harvest. Now, now let, me, let, me, let me bring you a little further. And, and let's talk about this just a little more. I, I, I want to share with you what it says in, in, a very, in a very popular proverb that possibly you've even read before yourself. Listen, listen to this. And this is in Proverbs chapter 3, starting down in verse 9. It's there that the wisest man that ever lived, according to Scripture, he recorded this. He said, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part or the first part, the first fruits of everything you produce. Then God will fill your barns with grain, he says, and your vats will overflow with good wine. Now there's something to be grasped here because we're, we're still thinking in terms of seed time and harvest. But Proverbs was written and Solomon says that first of all, you're to honor God with the first fruits. That's with the first tenth. That's with the tithe. This isn't a contingency phrase. Honor God if things are going well, if there's no pandemic, if there's no famine, if there's no difficult circumstances in my life, if I've got a six-figure income coming in, I'm to honor God. That's not what God's Word says. It says honor God with the first fruits, with the best part. Honor God. See, what giving does, it honors God. When you take that 10%, from your income, when you get paid, if your check's a hundred or if it's a thousand, you take that first tenth, that first ten dollars of a hundred or that first one hundred dollars of a thousand, and that is the first fruits. That's the best part. It's not what you have left over after you've paid your bills. It's saying, God, I'm going to honor you with the first and the best. When I get my paycheck, Lord, I'm not going to wait and see how things pan out at the end of the month because I can promise you the enemy will always see that you have more month than you have money. But if you say, God, I'm going to honor you with the first and the best, just write out that check. The minute you make that deposit, do your online giving of that first tenth. Just calculate it. Use your cell phone. Put in the amount of your paycheck and just times 10%. And it'll tell you what the tithe is. If your paycheck's $1,000, the tithe is $100. $50 is not tithe. $50 is just giving an offering. But really, in truthfulness, there's no offerings or seeds sown until your tithe is given. Because offering or seed for a harvest is after you've given God the first fruits. 
See, the tithe is called holy to the Lord in the Bible, and it belongs to the Lord. God said, the tithe is holy, and it is mine. Some people say, well, we're in the new covenant, so that doesn't pertain to me. Friends, God placed himself within parameters from which he operates, and those parameters remain in place. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, or perpetual laws, and so are the laws of sowing and reaping and finances, and so is it in the tithe. The tithe always belongs to God, and that is the first and the best. So once you've given God and honored Him with the first fruits, He says, and then with the best part of everything you produce, then you sow seeds out of your remaining monies. And there's no law to how much or nothing legislated as to how much an offering is, but once you've given your tithe, I encourage people, then give an offering, sow a seed in missions for missionaries. There, we, I, I know of a gentleman that's a part of our New Life family, and I leave it anonymous, but that gentleman gives the tithe. The very first thing he does whenever he has a job, he gives that tithe and, and, and does it in online giving. I mean, collects a check and goes straight to online giving and gives it. And once he's tithed, then he gives additional seeds. He'll sow them into missions and fire Bible and speed the light and into benevolence and into these other areas. He's just sowing these seeds. And, and you know what? God will honor that because as long as the earth remains, there's seed time and harvest. And so that law that God operates within is functioning. And I say that just to say, once you've honored God with the first fruit, honored God with the tithe, then the next thing you do, sow those seeds. Sow those seeds. Yeah. And, and when you do, God will see that your barns are filled with grain, and it says and that your vats overflow with good wine. Well, now, let me just share something with you, because somebody might say, well, Pastor, you're reading these Old Testament passages. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Let, let me bring you forward to the writings of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he makes some statements here that, that, are, that are very applicable. Let, let's turn over there together. 2 Corinthians, give me just a moment to get there and... and and we'll look at this together. He's writing to the Corinthian church. Now, now listen to what he says. And he's already in chapter 8 given them a call to generous giving. And now he's writing to them. And, and this is not about the tithe in this particular passage. This is what would fall under the heading or the topping of an offering. Because the tithe belongs to the Lord and is brought into the storehouse for the functioning of of the, the, the church, the, the body, that gathering of believers. But here he's gathering an offering that's over and above the tithe that would be considered a seed offering, and it's going to be used to help the believers uh, in the Jerusalem church. And, and so listen to what he says. He says, I, didn't, I don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem, for I know how eager you are to help, and I've been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm, he said to the Corinthians, that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. Wouldn't it be awesome if your giving, if your practice, if your lifestyle, if your generosity could be an example that would stir other people to, to, to not only tithing, but to generous giving in, in difficult circumstances and situations. He says, I'm sending these brothers to be sure you're really ready, uh, as I've been telling them, and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would, not, we would be embarrassed, he said, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I had told them, so I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Now listen to what he says. Remember that law, perpetual law of seed time and harvest? 
He says in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 9, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. He's saying, if you give generously, you reap generously. You sow generously, you reap generously. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Now right there, that shows you that this is not talking about the tithe. Because the tithe is not what you choose to give. The tithe is the first tenth. And God has established that. So out of the 90% remaining, God says, the only thing that I call holy to the Lord, the first fruits that belongs to me, is the tithe. But out of the 90% that you have remaining in your life, He says, I want you to decide how much from that that you're going to give. Decide what kind of seeds you want to sow because out of your decision of how you're going to sow, thus your harvest. Now let me pause and say this. God has already promised in Malachi chapter 3, in, down in the middle of that chapter, that when you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, God said that there are some, some parameters that He placed within Himself, that He placed Himself within, and He said, when you bring all of the tithe into the storehouse, I'm telling you that there's some specific things that I'm going to do because you have brought the tithe into the storehouse. Let's look at that. Now, let me pause for a moment before I continue on the seed. He says, he says, I want you to put me to the test, he says in, in Malachi, there chapter 3, verse 8, bring all the tithe into the storehouse, bring the whole tenth into the storehouse so that there'll be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, Listen to what God said. Now, God said this. He says, if you'll bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, He says, I'll open the windows of heaven for you. I'll pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant. I'll guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they're ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Isn't that awesome? God says that when you bring the tithe into the storehouse, He opens the windows of heaven, so your tithe is what opens heaven's windows, and from which God pours out blessings you're not able to contain. Some are financial, some are physical, some are relational, some are economical. They, they, they're just all kinds of blessings that God pours out upon your life when you bring the full tithe into the storehouse. And then he says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and cause the soil of your ground in your life to be productive. That's what God said the tithe does. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back over here to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9 and continue this portion about what your seed that you sow above your tithe what it does. He says, the farmer who plants only a few seeds gets a small crop, but the one who plants generously gets a generous crop. You must decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide. Now listen to this. He's talking about the seed. Seed time and harvest. Perpetual law. God operates within these laws. The law of the tithe opens the windows of heaven, pours out blessing, guards the harvest of your life, rebukes the devourer. That's what the tithe does. But now over and above your tithe, this is what the seed does in your life. God, it says, God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, 
They share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered. For God is the one who gives seed for the farmer, or seed for sowing, the Bible says, and bread to eat. See, the confusion that people find is they eat the seed that they ought to be sowing and, and, and instead of eating the bread that they have. He gives seed to sow and then seed to use for the bread that you eat. God gives you 90% of your livelihood to operate with to be a good steward. That's why you want to get out of debt. Don't live in credit card debt. Don't spend all of your money on high interest credit cards and where when you get paid and you give the tithe out of that 90% you've got left, you're so strapped with debt, you don't have any seed for sowing. Find ways. Get, get, get resources that instruct you and, and get rid of that debt. Pay that debt off. Don't quit giving the tithe because that belongs to God and you want God blessing the economy of your life. So give that tithe to God, but find ways to start sowing seed and watch that God's going to not only give you everything you need, He's going to increase. He said He would increase your resources and produce a great harvest of generosity in you. You. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they'll thank God. Two good things are going to result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry or your giving, they're going to give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you're obedient to the good news of Christ. Isn't that awesome? Wow. Seed for sowing and bread for eating. See, that law of seed time and harvest, it's a perpetual law. And as long as this earth continues, not only can you plant a tomato seed or a tomato plant and get tomatoes, friends, but when you sow resources into the work of God, when you bring your tithe and when you sow these offerings, friends, uh, it produces a harvest. And what happens is God's work expands and continues. And there's thanksgiving given to God because of your generosity. I just want to say a, a word or two here before I wrap up and pray. There's so many scandalous things that have happened in Christian circles in regard to finances. Uh, there are people that have taken the monies that, that, that precious followers of Jesus Christ have given, and they have used those abusively. There are people that have taken the resources from God's people and built personal kingdoms and domains with those. It's a fact. And if not, just look around a little bit and, and you'll find there's believers that today don't tithe because they were so wounded by the scandalous activities of somebody in the past that now that they'll look at someone present tense and say, I'm not giving a penny to that ministry because I'm not going to see that person or their family benefit in any kind of way because of the activity I saw in the past. So I'm just going to hang on to my monies and I'm going to use them the way I want to use them. And I'll call that the storehouse. Wherever I want to put it, I'll call that the storehouse. Friends, don't let the enemy rob you like that. Don't, don't let him rob you of God's goodness and God's blessings in your life. I want you to decide today that you're going to rededicate yourself to being a tither. There's some of you watching, and you used to tithe faithfully. Every time you got paid, the first monies you gave, it was tithe 10% right off the top, straight to God's work, and you don't do it anymore. There's some that for a while you tithed. You gave the tithe. And then for some reason, you got this thought process of, well, if I do that, I'm not going to get ahead. Or this big house payment that I've got, I, I'm going to be short at the end of the month if I, if I give this tithe. And so you hold on to it. 
Some are tithing, but you've never gone beyond the tithe. And, and I commend you for your consistency and faithfulness in tithing. But I want to encourage you. God's blessed you with surplus. Choose some portion of that and make that an offering that you're going to sow. And sow it intentionally. When you give that offering, go to your local church and, and, and to online giving and, and give that seed. Sow a seed to missions. Do it monthly. Sow it weekly. Whatever works in your the economy of your life. But I encourage you, over and above your tithe, decide on an amount and start doing it. And I want you to watch as you now, I'm not talking about taking a portion of your tithe and calling it missions or taking half of your tithe and calling it benevolence. No, the first tenth comes to God's house, to the storehouse. Now, if new life is not your home church, wherever you go, wherever you're committed, that's the storehouse where your tithe ought to go, to that church. You say, well, I don't go to church. Well, you ought to be in church. Come to new life. Watch online. Come see us on Sunday at 11. We'd love to have you as part of our church family. But I just want to remind you, find a church. Give that first tenth to the storehouse where your family's being blessed. I had a guy ask me one time. He was leaving the service. His kids had been back in the nursery, and one of them had been in kids' church. He had gathered his kids. The staff had been ministering. The nursery had been taking care of their little one and, and giving them snacks that, the church had bought and, and and possibly changing a diaper that and, and and taking care, just nurturing and ministering and teaching them and giving them their Bible handout for the day. And when they got ready to leave, this fellow stopped and he asked me a question. He said, Pastor, can I ask you a question? Is it okay with you? Do you think it would be okay instead of giving my tithe here to New Life? Do you think it would be okay if I sent it to a parachurch ministry over in another state on the East Coast because I know them and I'd like to support that ministry? Do you think it's okay for me to send my tithe to them? I know uh, that person probably didn't expect to hear what I said. But I said to them, I said, you know, I said, let me just tell you, what if everybody in New Life Church sent their tithe somewhere else? How would we pay the electric bills? How would we sustain ministry in Cyprus if everybody sent that tithe somewhere else instead of giving it to their local church? And he looked at me and he said, okay, and I, I guess I see what you're saying. And left, and and but I meant that, you know. Uh, I heard a preacher one time say to to a person, and I, I'm probably not as gouging and straightforward as this person was, but this this pastor told a person that asked him, "Is it okay if I don't tithe here? If I send my tithe somewhere else?" And that pastor looked at that man and said, well, I tell you what, when your kids grow up and need to get married, you'll need to carry them over to that organization to get them married. And, and if you have a loved one pass away, you'll need to contact them to take care of your, uh, the uh, funeral arrangements. And, and, and when you want a, a space to celebrate the high school graduation of your, your student, then you'll need to take them there and, and have all of those activities at that ministry location because that's where you're calling the storehouse in your life. And, you know, friends, uh, that's not said to be ugly and confrontational. I just say it to, to encourage you and remind you today that God wants to bless you. And God's parameters that he's placed himself within to operate in the economy of the Word of God is first of all the first fruits, the tithe. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse. God said, so you can prove me that I can open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that you're not able to contain. And then he said, decide out of that 90% how much seed you're going to sow. And if you'll sow generously, you'll reap generously. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap. But it'll be a sparing type reaping because it's in proportion to the seed you sow. And so I want you to structure and, and, and order your life and get yourself in a position where you can be more and more generous 
for the work of God so that God can be more and more generous to you and you'll always have everything you need and left over to share with others. That's the beauty of God's principle of sowing and reaping. Thank you, friends. I want to pray for you. I, I want to pray for those that have been injured by Christian circles, what call themselves Christian circles, and now financially you've, you've found yourself really struggling with tithing and with giving to the church because of what happened to you. I want to pray for God to touch you and heal you right now. Lord, I pray for those that are watching. Wonderful people. They love you, God. One time they were a leader. One time they stood across the front of that facility. Some even in another on another continent. They stood in the front of a massive crowd of people as a leader. And they ministered. They laid hands on others. They prayed for people and they were healed. They led people to Jesus. They led the way in their giving. They sacrificially gave. And then someone in leadership over them or around them abusively used those monies in ways that was totally unscrupulous. Just, just built personal kingdoms and domains with those monies. And today, some of those people, Lord, that are watching, God, they're wounded. They're not living in, within the realms of biblical uh, giving. They're not tithing. They're not sowing seeds over and above their tithe. And it's because of the things that, that they've encountered. But I pray right now, Lord, I pray for healing in their hearts. I rebuke the enemy and I release healing in the name of Jesus. I thank you that from this moment forward, God, you're going to give them what Paul called cheerfulness in their giving. Excited about bringing the tithe into the storehouse. Cheerful about using their resources to sow into the kingdom of God so that you can bless them. God, I pray that there'll be a Matthew 6 mindset in our hearts today. May we live and give with an eternal perspective. Thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for releasing that in our hearts right now. Worry is gone. We're going to be seek first His kingdom and His righteousness people from this day forward. It's going to be present not only in our followership, but in our stewardship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me tonight. I've enjoyed this time with you. And I just pray God will continue to bless you and minister to you and use you and that you'll grow. Just open your heart tonight. Say, God, I'm here. I'm all yours. Maybe you tuned in and watched and you heard me talking about resources, but you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. If not, right now, pray this prayer. Just say, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. And with my mouth, I boldly confess, Jesus, I surrender to your Lordship. Thank you for coming into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, friends, thank you so much. Join us at New Life Church, Cyprus, this Sunday at 11 a.m. We'll be in-house in service. And also, we'll be online at 11, live on Facebook Live as well as YouTube. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye now.